Hey, everybody. So for your attendance question this week, we have a little show and tell. Um, I've been reading about your pets, and I really want to see them, and I thought everybody else will want to see them too, right? Because they're so fun to, to watch, and it's also fun to try and take pictures of pets. So what I'm asking you to do for your um, attendance question is a little show and tell. Take a picture of your pet. Now, if you don't have a pet, I know a lot of you don't, right? If you don't have a pet, um, just take a picture of something that you have that's important to you or special to you. So whether that's your a picture of your phone or even if it's your face, right? Take a picture of your face. You're special. Show and tell us that. All right, so that's going to be the first thing that you're going to do or I guess just at some point this week. Make sure you do that. We, we'd love to see it. Love to see your important stuff. Happy week five. Can you believe it? I can't. So today I'm recording and it is a gorgeous day and I just can't be inside. So I'm doing all my work out on my patio. I have like a cover so that I can see the screen. Um, but there might be some background noise, uh, the neighbors, whatever. But hopefully the wind won't pick up too much so you guys hear it. Um, so by now, you know, we're, we're into Gortimer, we're in the thick of it, and most of us are noticing these things about Gortimer. A lot of people have commented on the twists that she has at the end, or if it's not a twist, maybe there's some sort of change in perception where all of a sudden you realize something that you didn't before. Um, she does like her unreliable narrators, right, where you have somebody who might not know the whole story or maybe believes what they think is right. I mean, we look at Hattie and we look at the narrator in the moment before the gun went off, right? They're very different people. Um, but they're both, you have to take what they say with a grain of salt. You also are seeing that she likes to do hints that you don't notice until the end, until you have that shift in perception or that twist where you realize, oh, she has been hinting at this. I just was taking what her narrator was saying at face value. And then um, very specific, very dynamic word choices. A lot of us are finding that, which is awesome. And the shifting time and chronology, which is driving some of you all crazy, I know, sorry, but um, it's done very purposefully, right? She's just feeding you the information that you need to know when you need to know it. And then, of course, her titles with double meanings. So you have your one meaning, but then there's usually always something deeper that she's trying to get across. So um, those are things that people are noticing, and I think you're all really accurate with that. And I think that's something to kind of keep in mind as we continue to read Nadine Gortimer. Um, so for this story that we're about to start, The Ultimate Safari, you are going to find that you have many of these hallmarks of Gortimer's style, um, but there is some information that you need to know. So this is information actually from an encyclopedia, an online encyclopedia. And it says, in an unrecorded talk she, Gortimer, gave at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg in 1991, Gortimer attributed the inspiration for the story, Ultimate Safari, to a visit she made to a camp for Mozambique refugees. The so-called bandits, alluded to by the story's main character and narrator, are presumably members of the Renamo, the Mozambique rebel group that tried for years with the clandestine support of South Africa to overthrow Mozambique's Marxist government. So um, the bandits, the bad guys in the story, are actually supported by um, the South African government because they want to continue apartheid and they want to continue to keep um, their control, um, the whites. By the time the events of the story take place, liberation movements in countries across Africa had long since swept whites from power, with South Africa being the single exception, right? So the Mozambique bandits are not white. However, it's in South Africa's interest if they are in chaos, because then people won't be thinking about the apartheid. They won't be thinking about how to help um, the people of South Africa to um, combat apartheid. Instead, they're going to be focused on their own civil war. 
So throughout the 1970s and 1980s, in an attempt to protect itself and white power structure, South African government supported the destabilization efforts of rebels in its black-controlled neighboring countries by financing armed insurgents and raids, such as the one that the narrator describes in the story. So right there, you know there's going to be um, some rebels, or you know there's going to be an uprising. I'm going to tell you that's right at the beginning, though. That's not actually what our story is about, but it is the premise for the story. It's what sets the story up at the beginning. So another thing that we need to know that we might not be familiar with is Kruger National Park. Now Kruger National Park is um, the place to go for African safaris. Um, it's huge. Um, a lot of it is surrounded by electrified fences so that the animals kind of stay there. Um, animals that used to roam all over Africa are kind of contained. That way they can conserve them and they can make sure that um, those animals don't go away, right? They don't want them to be extinct. So they're conserving, but it also creates um, some, a place for people to go and visit. So if you've seen people in Africa in their Jeeps going on safari, it's a lot of times this Kruger National Park is where they're headed. You can see the pictures. It's like something straight out of Lion King, right? It's absolutely a gorgeous place. And so the people who visit there and the people who work there have very different lifestyles as well as the people in this story who are going through Kruger National Park which you'll read about. We also need to know about refugee camps so um, I know you've all you all know what refugee camps are but this story is going to talk a lot about the refugee camps and in this version of the story, there's one giant tent, and within that tent, there's a whole bunch of smaller tents like you see in these pictures. Um, so that makes a little difference. I couldn't find a picture of that specifically, but I kind of wanted to just have you have that idea. Um, all these different people joining together um, to escape from wherever they are. In this case, escape the civil war that's going on in Mozambique. All right, another thing that we need to know about, it's not entirely essential, but I think it's going to help you understand the story a little bit more and why Nadine Gordimer includes um, some of the animals that she does. So in South Africa, you would know about elephants, right? It'd be like our knowing about, I was going to say wood ticks or mosquitoes, but I don't know why I'm only thinking of pests. Um, it'd be like our knowing about walleyes, right? Most people know about fish and um, fishing. So elephants, these are six little facts here from the independent. Um, first, in, with elephants, females are the boss. And so that's something that's a little bit different than a lot of other animals. Um, and they actually babysit other people's, or other people's, sorry, other elephants' um, calves. So if the mother is going somewhere, then another elephant will watch over that elephant for them. They also form really strong bonds. Um, they're almost like human in their love for each other. and um, It's a really interesting um, connection. They do walk in a single file line like you see. So they kind of follow that um, leader, that female leader, the cow. And they, all the other cows and their babies follow as well. Um, guys hang out in groups too, the male cows. That was actually the independence words, not mine guys. I think that's cute. Um, so once they're about 12 to 15, then they um, separate from the group. Um, so these groups that you see walking in lines are females, their cows, and then their babies. The bulls are separate. And the bulls can hang out together too. Usually there's like an alpha bull, for lack of a better word. I don't know what they call them. But there's one in charge. And then um, when they need to mate, they go find the cat the cows and then go back to being separate um, but herds can separate so if you have a giant herd and something happens they can go separate ways they still can communicate with each other for a long way actually but sometimes they'll separate it doesn't mean that they are becoming unfriendly towards each other just like life circumstances sometimes herds have to separate go find you know, um, food in different areas and that kind of thing. So hopefully that'll help you understand the stuff that Gordimer kind of takes for granted that you would know. Um, also, lions and hunting. This is something that Gordimer also takes for granted um, that you would know as well. So I have the link up here to play it, and I'm going to play it 
there's some weird echo things going on when I try and do it. So I'm also going to put it as a link on the assignment on Schoology. So you can check that out and watch it that way if it's kind of obnoxious. So I want to close then in case you're not going to watch it on this, in case you're going to watch it separately by saying, I'm really proud of the work that you've been doing. I cannot believe the amazing things you are all coming up with. Um, it's just really exciting for me to read it. Like the, the symbols that you guys came up with. Oh my gosh. It's so exciting and profound. And um, I was nervous, you know, because boredom is so thick, right? She's very meaty. There's a lot to it. And reading your answers to your questions, you really seem to be understanding what's happening. Um, and I just cannot believe it. I just, I don't know why it surprises me so much. It shouldn't. You guys were awesome in class. I don't know why it would surprise me that you're awesome outside of class, but it's just so hard, I think, this distance learning stuff. And that you are all just embracing it is blows my mind. So um, kudos to you all. I'm, like I said, just so proud. Okay, um, I'm going to stop before I get emotional because I miss you guys. Um, anyway, learn about lions. Um, and then when you're reading the ultimate safari, consider all of this. Um, there's going to be talk about motif this week. There's a link on, um, it'll be a link there. If you don't remember what a motif is, you can go check that out. As always though, shoot me an email, send me a school G message. If you have a question or if you just need to check in or to chat or something. Um, oh, and oh, this week, um, I just, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Um, make sure you're continuing with your global issue and your claim. Some of you, I don't think, watched the video about it. Make sure you watch that video so you know what the difference is. And if you're still confused, send me an email or write me a Schoology message so I can help you. We can communicate via Zoom or we can talk on the phone if it's easier for me to explain it. In, um, I was going to say face-to-face, -face, but you know what I mean. All right, I'm rambling. Okay playing lions. Here we go. Bye. For a lion on its own, only one hunt in seven is successful. Hunting in pairs is more profitable. A family of warthogs with young piglets is a gift not to be missed. The pair crouch low in the grass, edging forward. It's a team effort. run at a top speed of 50 miles per hour, and with a far longer stride than the warthog, they can't fail to catch their meal. The juvenile warthog makes a tasty snack for the lions. Working as a team, up to 50% of group hunts end in a kill. It's usually the females who do most of the hunting. One female weighs as much as two fully grown men, so a pride is a force to be reckoned with. A buffalo makes for a hefty meal. The lions follow a herd for long distances. Buffalo are dangerous. The lion's tactics are crucial. This is the feline hunter's front line. They move in, encircling the buffalo and split the group. A buffalo is three times heavier than a lion and has deadly horns and sharp hooves that can inflict fatal wounds.
some of the lions attack from behind. Others distract the buffalo, giving those piercing horns and hooves out of reach. Three topple the buffalo from the rear, while two grab the neck and muzzle and start to suffocate him. Super sensitive to the slightest vibration, the lion's whiskers tell them when their prey has stopped breathing and it's safe to let go. It can take up to 13 minutes for the buffalo to die. All right. Take care, all.